Hey guys, I want to thank all of you who bought my transformer winding calculators and tutorials. To answer some of the questions you've had and make it easier for you to understand some of the practical aspects of winding a transformer, I thought I'd do a video showing you the process step by step one more time. If you're planning on winding a transformer for your electronics project, before doing anything else you should consider all the necessary aspects and characteristics currents and voltages needed, the way the transformer is going to be mounted on a chassis, the amount of space you have, etc. Once you know and you've double checked the specs needed, you should write them down on a piece of paper or to your phone or PC. You'll need a way to calculate the number of turns and thickness of wire and to make sure that the wire will fit the bobbin you intend to use. There are many ways to do that, but the best way of course is to use one of my transformer calculators. You can find the link in the description to my website and there will be an iPhone version as well soon in the App Store. So be sure to check that out as well in the near future. So go ahead and open the Simple Power Transformer winding spreadsheet and we can start with the designing and calculating. Even if you're used to using Imperial system I would strongly recommend using the metric system for designing the transformers because it's a lot easier and all you need is a ruler with the metric scale on it. Let's start with the frequency, so from the top left. Make sure that you edit only the fields which are transparent. The rest is calculated for you automatically. You can also follow the written PDF tutorial for more detailed information. If you're in the US, choose 60 Hz instead of 50. If you want a transformer with less losses and less temperature rise or less heat, you can choose a more conservative value like 9400 Gauss. If you're using a higher quality laminations which are rated for 12,000 Gauss, you can easily use 10,000 or even 11,000 or more. The next is primary voltage. Again, if you're in US, you can use 120 volts. Don't type anything into the current draw field for the primary, it is automatically calculated from the rest of the secondary values. For the secondary voltages, we will use the same voltages used in the PDF tutorial. You can use the available data sheet from the Classic Tone website or check the tube data for the tubes you'll be using. So for AB1, push-pull operation, we check the nominal current draw and we use that in our current draw field. Make sure to convert all the values to amps and not to use milliamps. Since the filament winding will have the highest current draw and relatively the highest voltage drop, we can use a slightly higher value, so 6.75 volts and 5.3 volts. We use 1.65 and 2 amps respectively. Once we have all those values in place, we check the recommended core cross section. We can use EI84 in metric or 3 and 3 eighths of inch laminations for Imperial since that fits the original chassis as well. If you're buying the laminations in US, the reference value for this size would be 1 and 1 eighths inch, which is the size of the cross section. We have several options for plastic bobbins, which are 28 times 28 millimeters, 28 times 30, and so on. We will use the 28 times 45, which is roughly 1 and 1 8 times 1 and 7 8. The spreadsheet will automatically change the color of the cell from green to red, depending on the core size you choose. So if you choose a core size which is smaller than the recommended one, the cell will be filled with red color. If you select the proper size core, the cell will be green. It seems that we will have to be extra neat when winding this one for 230 volts at 50 Hz, since it is at 85.2%. Anything above 85 gets marked red, because it is very difficult to wind the transformer neatly enough manually. For winding transformers you'll essentially need the following. A utility knife, some heat shrink tubing, a bobbin, wire cutters of some sort, kapton and masking tape, and pressed paper. You can pre-cut the heat shrink tubing by measuring it roughly on the bobbin you're going to use.
You'll also need a winding device to wind the wire onto the bobbin. You can make an improvised winder with a drill or a motor, or just make a simple crank jig. For this demonstration I'll be using a readily available manual Chinese winder NZ1, which is available from eBay and other places. The quality of this winder is not the best and you have to be careful when using it because the counter is a bit flimsy. But all in all, it's okay and I've wound countless transformers and chokes using it, so it can serve you well with a bit of luck. Take the pre-cut piece of heat shrink tubing and run a wire through it. Cut out a small piece of masking tape and secure the wire with it. I will hand feed the wire. The spool of wire can either be just vertically sitting on the floor under the winder or on a metal rod secured between the two wooden blocks. For a fine thin wire, leaving the spool of wire on the ground works better, since the tension is not too strong and the wire is less likely to break. Ok, let's start winding. Once you have the wire and the heat shrink tube secure on the bobbin, start winding slowly and don't worry if you don't manage to wind the wire perfectly one next to the other. It is not critical. Just try to keep the wire as evenly wound as you can and keep the enough tension on the wire so that it doesn't break but is still firm on the bobbin. And go from left to right and try not to stay in one place too long to avoid uneven build up. Once you have the number of turns you need, make sure to secure the winding with a piece of masking tape while the wire is still under tension, and then cut the wire and use another piece of shrink tubing to secure the end of the wire in place. Having wound and secured the primary winding, you can apply the insulation. For the insulation between the primary and the secondary, use a couple of wraps of Kapton tape and make sure to cover the whole bobbin and not have the wire sticking out from the sides of the bobbin. Insulation between the primary and the secondary should be really done without compromise to avoid any safety issues later. When you wind the thicker wire for the filaments, I usually do it by hand since it has to be perfectly neat not to take too much space. The cheaper winders don't have enough power and torque to wind thicker wires than 0.6mm properly. Instead of using one thick wire for filaments, you could also use two or three layers of thinner wire in parallel. Once you have all your windings wound, you can remove the bobbin from the winder. The ends of the wire don't need to be too long, so now it's time to trim them. You can leave a bit more of thinner wire, let's say 2 inches or so, and for the thicker wire you can leave half inch. 
Since the wire is coated with two coats of enamel, in order to solder to it properly we need to remove the enamel and just leave the wire with clean copper. The best and fastest way by far is to use the utility knife to scrub the enamel off the wire. Make sure to only scrub the enamel and make only lateral movements. If you press down into the wire it will make it snap. It's easier than it looks so give it a try. Make sure to scrape the enamel from all sides of the wire. Use good lighting to see the difference in color on the wire so that you can remove all the enamel that's left there. When the wire is cut and insulation removed from it, you can prepare the stranded wire leads that will be the final leads of our transformer. Don't spare the wire for the leads since it's easier to cut it to length later than to extend it. Use around 18 inches or 45 centimeters. There is a standard color code for transformers that you can follow, but it requires having a lot of different colors of wire on hand. Of course it's okay to use any kind of color code as long as you know which colors you used for which wires and you write it down. Now remove the half inch of insulation on the stranded wire. Flip the wire to the bobbin and wind the thin wire around the stranded wire lead. Having several turns around the wire will make sure that there is no current loss at this point so to avoid any voltage drop or overheating later. Solder the two wires together and make sure to provide enough heat on both wires and only then apply the solder evenly. Once the solder cools use a heat shrink tube to cover the joint and continue to the next one. Once you have both sides of any winding with the lead soldered to it, you can check the resistance or continuity of that winding to make sure the wires you've soldered make good connections. Then secure the wires in place with a couple of pieces of masking tape. Push the leads as far to the other end of the bobbin so that the leads come out flat on the side that will be used at. Repeat the same procedure and for the thicker wire do the opposite. Wind the stranded wire around the thick filament wire and then solder it. Once all the leads are there, wrap the bobbin with several layers of pressed paper to give the transformer a uniform look. Secure the ends with a couple of pieces of masking tape. And you now have the whole transformer wound and leads ready. The only remaining part is to insert the core laminations and pot the transformer. For power transformers and push-pull transformers, the EI type laminations are inserted in such a way that you first insert all E-shaped lamination by inserting one from one side and the other from the other side.
Once you have all of the laminations inserted, you should place the transformer on a flat surface and hammer all the laminations flat using a wooden or rubber mallet. Now insert the I-shaped laminations in the gaps between the E-shaped laminations. Be aware that the laminations can be sharp and can cut your fingers. You can use some sort of gloves to avoid getting hurt. Once all the laminations are in place and hammered flat, you should make a mount for them. If the transformer is going to be laid flat on the chassis like in old Fender amplifiers, you can just use long screws and that's all. But if you want to mount it vertically, then use L-shaped aluminum profile and cut it to size and drill the holes for the screws. I use hacksaw to cut it to size and then drill the holes on the drill press. Make the holes slightly oversized to avoid screws not fitting or getting stuck in the laminations. Once again I try to make the laminations as flat as I can and then I use the screws and the profiles to secure the laminations. For the top of the transformer you can use a smaller piece of eye lamination which fits or just use an aluminum profile again. Make sure to tighten the screws well to prevent the transformer from buzzing. If you have longer screws you can cut the ends so they don't stick out too far out. And here we have our perfectly wound and secure transformer. The last step before testing the transformer is to put it in resin or wax. There are commercially available resins and similar products for transformers, but they are very expensive and not healthy to inhale. Here in Europe I find relatively cheap blocks of beeswax from the beekeepers. Beeswax is healthy if you are not allergic to it of course, and smells nice and it's really easy to use and lasts a long time. Use a double pot, heat it up on the stove. I would suggest a dedicated one since the wax is difficult to remove once it's cooled down. Fill the lower pot with water and let the wax melt. Tie a piece of thick wire around the transformer mounts and pot it in wax for 5 to 10 minutes.
When you remove it from the wax, make sure that there are no chunks of wax stuck to the transformer. It should all be liquid and try to clean it straight away with paper towels. Be careful because the wax is hot and can hurt you or even burn you. Leave the transformer to cool down overnight or at least 5-6 hours and then proceed to testing. To test the transformer, make sure that the leads are not touching one another. Connect the primary to the variable transformer and before turning the power on, connect the leads of the meter to one of the secondary windings. Set the meter to volt AC at the highest range. Once you have all the windings checked, you can install the transformer and then test it again in the circuit under load. As you can see, winding transformer is not intimidating as it seemed at all. You just need a little bit of practice and after you've made and wound several examples, you will be amazed how perfectly they work and how good results you can achieve with just a little work. Thank you for watching, if you would like to calculate and design your own transformers, don't forget to check the links in the description for my website and the spreadsheet calculators I have for sale. If you would like to support me and see more videos like this, consider becoming my patron on Patreon page, you can check that in the link in the description as well. Thanks for watching and thanks for all your support.